My name is Apricardis. Four words spoken from a toothless mouth, and it instantly changed how I saw him. He went from just another homeless old man to somebody with a name, somebody with a story, somebody's son, somebody's grandfather. For the past year, I've been walking up to random strangers and asking them their names and their stories. It all happened a year ago. It was actually Youth Day, 16th of June, and I was driving to Builders Warehouse to fill up my gas bottle. It was the middle of winter, and I'm sure in Bloom you also have this sight, guys standing there with signs, plumber, electrician, painter. And as I saw that, it just struck me again that on a day where 40 years ago people died for equality, there's still things that are so unequal in South Africa today. There's the great divides between rich and poor and black and white. And I made a decision that morning. I decided, you know what, I can't change anyone else, but I can change myself, and I can change my attitude towards people that I come across that are not like me. Now, the very next day, that was put to the test when I drove out of my safe townhouse complex, and right in front of the gate is Apricardi sitting there on the curb. And I thought, oh, I made that little decision yesterday. I was driving to pick and pay. I bought him a Burvos roll and a Coke and some fruits. And instead of just handing it out the window, which I usually would have done, I decided I'm going to sit down and talk to him. And so I sat down, and Apricardis told me his name and his story. Apricardis was two when he moved from Egypt to South Africa with his parents. He grew up on a farm and worked as a farm laborer for most of his life. He, his mom was actually shot in front of him. He watched her die in front of him. And he told me he'd been on the street for 15 years. He had no family left, he had no friends left. And I said, Apricardis, how old are you? And he said, I'm 92. And I was like, wow. Okay, he didn't look 92. He wrote down his ID number for me. He was 92. He'd been born in the 20s, okay? Just imagine the stories that he could tell. Now, I'm a photographer, and I said, please, can I take your picture and can I share your story? And so I started this Facebook page called I Have a Name. This is my story, in the hope of finding Apricardis, um, a place in a homeless shelter somewhere. And this was the middle of winter, and I realized a few things. One, that the homeless shelter is awful in the middle of winter, and the second, that they don't take elderly over the age of 65, because they're a liability. But thanks to social media, the story was shared, and eventually, after a few days, somebody got back to me and said, listen, I've got a place for him in a homeless shelter, I'll come and fetch him. But by this time, Apricardis had disappeared, and I never saw him again. But what that did do is that it opened up my eyes to people that were on the street, and I started speaking to people. So I just want to share a few of the stories that I've come across in the past year. This is Lizzie. I met Lizzie, I was walking to the spa, and it was a Sunday afternoon, and Lizzie was with three friends, and she stopped me, and she said, please, do you have some money for food? I'm sure that you've had that experience before. Maybe it's just me, I've just got the face that says, you know, I'll help you. But um, now, instead of giving her food or giving her some money, I also decided to ask why. And this is the story that came out. You see, Lizzie and her friends had been living under the Rivonia Bridge for the last four years. Um, they built a little settlement. There was about 12 men, four women. Um, they built some shacks, and their business was recycling. So they'd go out in the morning, about four or five o'clock in the morning, um, with their trolleys through the industrial areas, pick up recycling, bring them back, sort them out, and then they could drop them off at a depot and sell, you know, get about 100, 150 rand per person that way. Um, but Lizzie told me that the previous week, the police had come. They said there'd been a complaint from a townhouse complex across the river that said the shacks were unsightly and that they had to leave. But Lizzie said, we have nowhere to go. Okay, there's informal settlements in the area, but she said, we can't afford to live there. We can't afford the taxi fare, first of all, or the shack rent. And so then we can't make an honest living. And so they didn't move. The following night, she said, the police came back, this time with petrol. They lined them up on the street. They threw petrol on their shacks and burned them to the ground. And that was what was left of, of um, Lizzie's shack. So all her bedding, all her clothes, all her documents, ID book, everything was burnt. And that's why Lizzie was on the street and was asking for food. Now, I posted Lizzie's picture. She had a 
beautiful smile and a beautiful attitude despite her circumstances and um, shared this on social media. And some amazing things happened, hey? Uh, the one thing, there was um, a lady, a good Samaritan in Joburg. She said, I will pay for these ladies to get off the street. I'll um, put them in a, I'll, I'll pay for rent for a shack for three or four months, set them up with a second-hand clothing business so that they can become self-sufficient. And that's what she did. Another thing was that Lizzie had lost contact with her sister four years previous. And her sister happened to be on Facebook. All of a sudden, saw her sister's face appear. And so she was reconnected with her sister. Um, also, this was during the CEO sleep out. And quite a few of the schools also participated with that. And they'd seen Lizzie's story, contacted her, because I always put the contact number of the person that I feature, and said, would you come and speak to our high school students about what it's really like being homeless? And so Lizzie became a public speaker for an evening. And she phoned me the following day, and, she, and I said, well, hi, Lizzie, how did it go? And she said, oh, it was, it was excellent. But she said, at one point, I was sitting on stage, and I was really remembering what it was like, and I got really emotional. And I got tears in my eyes, but I was looking at the audience, and I saw that they had tears in their eyes, too. And I was like, wow, Lizzie, you must have made a real impact. See, what Lizzie taught me was that you can invest in one person, and the ripple effects can touch many lives. In Susan's case, it was one question and one answer that changed her life. You see, Susan is a mother of four, single mom, spitting one child through university, studying tourism, and she bakes. Now, she sits on the corner of William Nickel and Leslie Road, and she has bread. Now, this is her grandmother's recipe that's been passed down, and it's the best bread around, apparently. Also, she makes fat cook, and um, she wakes up at 3.30 every morning to make this bread. Now, she can only make one loaf because she's got one little primer stove, okay? And over an open fire, she makes a fat cook, she bakes her bread, and she gets in the taxi at 5 o'clock and sits on the roadside to sell her wares to um, commuters coming off the taxis in the morning in four ways. Now, I bought some of Susan's bread, and it was delicious. And I said to her, Susan, if you had one wish, what would it be? Now, she didn't hesitate. She said, a defied chakalaka stove. And I was like, OK, I don't know what that is, but I wrote it down, and I went home, and I looked it up on trusty Google. And it turned out it was a wood-burning stove, which makes sense, because Susan lives in deep slot extension one, when there's no electricity, there's no running water. It's really the worst part of deep slot. So I posted her story, and at the end, I thought, oh, you know, what can I lose? I'll just ask if anybody wants to give Susan a stove. And oh my goodness, <laughs> this story went completely viral. It was like everybody's aunt and uncle and cousins and nieces and nephews, everybody wanted to give Susan a stove. But most of them were not very practical. Susan lives in a tiny shack, okay? She can't store 100 stoves. Um, the reach of that story was half a million. It was, was ridiculous. But one lady got back to me, and she was from Durban. And she said, I have a stove that's been specially designed for women like Susan in the townships. And I will drive it from Durban to Joburg. I'll install it in her shack. And I will set her up with business training so that she can start a home, um, home bakery. It was incredible. So the SABC also read the story and put Susan on the news. And this is Cherry delivering the stove. And I've got a video clip of when the stove arrived that I want to share with you. OK, so let's see where we're going to put the stove. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good place for it. Anyway, as yeah, long as yeah. you're yeah. yeah, not going to be a You are a bakery, Susan. Look at that, eh? Hey? You're going to be a bakery. Richmond? Hello? Are all these first? Yeah. Three. Three. Okay. Yes. Ooh, just checking. That's five loaves of bread at one time, okay. hey? So the nice. There's one, there was one more box that's coming with Godfrey and his brother. Okay. Yeah. 
So what, what's the plan, bro? Rich, where, where do you record it? Uh, basically, what we're gonna try and do. Okay. Let's see if we can put it like. For the, Mama uh, Mimi. So this is the best thing they ever invented. The chimney, maybe out. Ooh. This cuts your breath. You yeah. slice your breath through here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Facing outside. So we'll see once it's all. No, you got everything here. Look, you've got, yeah. you got a pizza slicer. Yes. Yeah, was, and you got a rolling yeah. pin. I mean, if we had that like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm, taking, I'm uh, taking a video. Oh, I'm going to a bakery set. You are a bakery yeah, set up now, hey? La, 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 la. You see it? I was worth it, hey? <laughs> so Susan got her stove. And, you know, I've shared two very happy stories with you. But obviously this is real life. And not every story has a happy ending. Like Roy. I found Roy on the street. He told me he'd been orphaned at a young age, grew up in a foster family that abused him, and he had broken up with his girlfriend who took everything, and that's how he'd ended up on the street. Now, he had a driver's license, and I thought, well, you know what, he might be employable since he has a driver's license. So I shared his story, and within minutes from the comments that started coming in, I realized, okay, there's a big part of his life that he didn't share with me, and that's the fact that he was a drug addict. And... Um, as you know, in social media, people are very comfortable sharing their, their views. I almost had to take this story down because it got quite um, yeah, heated. But an interesting thing happened. Although there were those that wanted to crucify Roy, there was others that said, you know what, he deserves a second chance. And somebody said, I have a space for him in a rehab if he wants it. And Roy did want it, so he went to rehab. And I was like, yay, he's got a happy ending after all. But sadly, within 24 hours, I got a message that he had signed himself out and he was back on the street. It seems like the older I get, the more I realize that I actually don't know anything at all. And in this past year, I've really been brought face to face with my own naivety, my own misconceptions. And um, Pastor Jonathan was someone who introduced me to an idea I had never heard of before. And that was the water mafia. Have you guys heard of the water mafia? Okay, well, I'd never heard of the water mafia. Jonathan um, is a pastor in a settlement called Findisi. It's about three kilometers away from the most upmarket housing development happening in Gauteng at the moment, I think. And Findisi's got no electricity, they've got no running water. These are the toilets that they have. They don't even have those plastic little things that are usually put up in informal settlements. And they have one Jojo tank, and that Jojo tank is for 300 people, and one of the community leaders has hijacked it. And he comes and he sits there at the end of the day, after he finishes work, he unlocks it and he sells water, five rand, 12 liters of water, to the poorest of the poor. And I was like, are you serious? This is happening on my doorstep. I'd like never thought, I'd never, that was a concept I'd never thought of before. Now, thankfully, two Jojo tanks without locks were donated to this community. And this is how women respond when they haven't had free water. So people ask me all the time, you know, you've been doing this for a year, you've interviewed hundreds of people, you've made a big impact, you've got over 25,000 followers, what is next? What's the next big thing you're going to do with this? And you know what, the truth is, I'm not a big plan kind of person at all, okay? The fact that I'm standing here is actually, it's a joke if you really knew me, okay? But <laughs> I don't know if you believe in God, but I do, and he seems to specialize in using the most unqualified, unlikely things, because then he gets the glory. And so that's, seriously, that's what he's doing something with this page. So I don't know where it's going to go, but I've got a front row seat, so it'll be exciting to see where it goes. Um, on a personal front, I've got three daughters, and it's been interesting watching their eyes being opened the past year. Um, they haven't always appreciated mummy going up to random strangers and talking to them. <laughs> For instance, when I met Roy, I was going out on a date with one of my daughters, and before we left the house, she said, okay, mommy, this is your day, my day, 
please no talking to like strangers today. So I was like, okay, I respect that. So we leave the house, park at the mall, get out of the car and walk straight into Roy. And I'm like, oh man. So I walk past him, I don't make eye contact. And as soon as we're out of earshot, she says to me, mommy, I know this was going to be our day, but I think that guy needs you to talk to him. And so it's when the penny drops and when eyes are open, and I really believe that you know, for the next generation, that if empathy is created, that's going to bridge those great divides that we have in South Africa. Also, when the Jojo tanks were delivered in Fundisi, my youngest daughter was eight. She was with me, and um, she saw the tanks arrive, she saw the ladies dance. And that night when she went to bed and I tucked her in, she said, Mommy, if we lived there, I wouldn't get 50 rand pocket money a month, would I? And I said, no, sweetie, you wouldn't. She said, I'd probably only get five, hey? And I was like, well, yeah, if you're lucky. <laughs> and she said, you know what? I wouldn't spend it on sweets either. I was like, well, what would you spend it on? She said, I'd spend it on water. So I want to leave you with two questions. The one question is, what is your name? And the second question is, what is in your hand? Because the thing is, we all have things in our hand. This is a little bird that fell out of a nest in our garden last year. And it ended up in the hands of my eight-year-old daughter, who's, got, who's passionate about animals. She wants to be a vet one day. And she said, Mommy, I'm going to save this little bird. I was like, you're right. <laughs> like, it's not going to survive, right? But the thing is, it didn't end up in my hands. It would have died if it ended up in my hands. But it ended up in her hands, and little Trixie <laughs> actually survived. So the thing is, don't sit back and just think about change. Get up and do the next small thing that is in your hands. It doesn't have to be a big thing. We don't have to be big people to make a change, make a difference. Because it's in doing those small things that we can really change the world. One of my favorite authors, says Deep, Dr. Zeus, <laughs> said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It is not. Thank you.